friends Raji. Let me warmly welcome you to this webinar, which is the fourth in a series of webinars scheduled to be conducted throughout this year. The webinar today will be on the basics of parental and parenteral nutrition, which, although is a very important topic, is largely neglected in gastroenterology practice. The topic will be presented by Dr. Timothy Vikramasekara, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce the speaker. Dr. Timothy Vikramasekara graduated from the Faculty of Medicine during the Hello. We can hear you now, sir. We couldn't hear you for some time. The introduction part we could hear. Do you did you hear the introduction or not? Uh, no, no, not talk. All right. Uh, it's not the introduction of proximity. Can I uh, reintroduce Dr. Timothy? Uh, Dr. Timothy Vikramasekara graduated from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania in 2007 and soon after completed his MSc and MD in Clinical Nutrition from the University of Colombo. He later underwent advanced training in Clinical Nutrition during a fellowship attached to the National Intestinal Failure Unit of Salford Royal Hospital in England. He is currently working as Acting Consultant Nutrition Physician in the Ministry of Health. Over to you, Dr. Vikramasekar. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, today, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Timothy Vikramasekar, and I am going to talk about the basic of enteral and parental nutrition. The outline of my lecture is shown here. First, I will be talking about enteral nutrition and then move on to parental nutrition. Under enteral nutrition, I am going to discuss about differences uh, in enteral formula categories, in administration method, blenderized meal, uh, how to monitor enteral and uh, enteral nutrition and managing complication related to enteral feeding. Secondly, I will explain about the basic of parental feeding with relate to its indication, type, site, and regime. Enteral formula are considered as a medical food. It's neither a milk nor a drug. According to FDA, an enteral formula is a food which is formulated to be consumed or administered enterally under the supervision of physician and which is intended for specific dietary management of a disease or condition for which distinctive nutritional requirement based on recognized scientific principles are established by medical evaluation. This is one of the things I want to highlight when it's come to enteral feeding. As most, uh, as most people consider enteral feeding as a milk, but not as a therapeutic formula. There are different types of formula ever in the market. Uh, when prescribing, it is very important to consider features of that formula to address the 
particular indication. It is better to know that all the adult therapeutic formula are lactose free. Among them, standard, polymer, standard polymeric formula is the most common type. Uh, it contain uh, 1.2 to uh, 1 to 1 1.2 calories per ml and it is isotonic. Therefore, uh, for most of the patients, this can be used to provide additional calories without complication. High protein formula. Enteral feeding formulas with a non-protein calorie to nitrogen ratio less than 125 to 1 can be considered as a high protein uh, formula. Hence, in an adult patient with estimated protein requirement exceeding 1.5 gram per kg per day may benefit from high protein formula. High calorie density formula. High calorie density formulation are concentrated to provide less fluid and electrolytes. They provide 1.5 to 2 cal per ml. For patients who need fluid and electrolytes restriction, such as those with kidney insufficiency or congestive cardiac failure, this formula can be beneficial to provide extra calories without complication. Move to the next uh, formula, uh, elemental and uh, peptide-based one. Elemental and peptide-based uh, 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 formulas have protein and fat components that are hydrolyzed into smaller pre-digested forms. Elemental products are low in uh, elemental uh, formula uh, products are low in fat and contain amino acid. On the other hand, peptide products are high in median chain triglyceraldehyde and contain protein as a peptide. Current research evidence shown, uh, shows less indication for both these formula, uh, both these formulas. So usage is low in current city. Then uh, newer enteral feeding formulation have been uh, designed to meet unique nutrition uh, requirement and manage metabolic abnormalities associated with specific disease stations. Condition for which specialized enteral feeding formulation exists include kidney and liver failure, uh, lung disease, diabetes, wound healing, and metabolic stress. Uh, those are the adult uh, uh, nutrition for, uh, formula. Uh, when it uh, comes to pediatric formula, most of the pediatric formulas are designed as a standard polymeric. But there are lactose-free formulas in addition to lactose formula. Therefore, we can prescribe lactose-free formulas to children with lactose intolerance. There are cow milk based formula, soy protein based formula, semi elemental formulas, and formulas appropriate to their age and maturity. Uh, if we compare adult and pediatric formulas, adult formulas have more protein and carbohydrate, pediatric formulas contain more fat when compared to adult formulas. When it's come to micronutrient, adult formula have uh, more folic acid than zinc, whereas pediatric formula, uh, formulas have more calcium and vitamin D. Uh, in these formulas, most of the carbohydrate are in the form of carbohydrate polymers instead of simple sugars. In other words, hydrolyzed carbohydrates. This is done to make the osmolarity less and match to the body osmolarity. Because of that, it is less palatable compared to general milk product. When it comes to uh, fat, 
medium chain triglyceride uh, triglyceride are absorbed throughout the gut including the colon uh, in addition they don't use pancreatic lipase for the digestion and absorption therefore patient with less gut length or pancreatic insufficiency mcd based formula are beneficial okay after discussing about the formulas we can talk about administrative method enteral feeding can be continuous cyclic bolus or intermittent Continuous feed, uh, generally this method of choice is for feeding critically ill patient, patient who have poor glycemic control, uh, patient who are being fed by a jejunous tube, or have demonstrated to intolerance to intermittent or bolus feeding. Uh, for adult, uh, target, uh, target ad enteral nutrition administration rate generally range from 50 to 120 ml per hour, although higher rates have been used without complications. The primary disadvantage of this method is the cost and inconvenience associated with pump and administration sets. Uh, when it comes to cyclic feeding, it, it still can be considered as a continuous feeding, but it will be delivered overnight, freeing the patient from the pump during the day and allow for greater mobility. This is really beneficial for patients who are under rehabilitation. Uh, bonus feeding. Uh, I think it is commonly used for patients in long-term chaosetine who have gastrostomy. Uh, administration technique involve, uh, involves the delivery of the enteral feeding formulation over 5 to 10 minutes. Depending on the patient nutrition requirements and uh, installation volume of 240 to 500 ml uh, is generally used and repeated uh, 4 to 6 times daily. Bolus volume given to infant and children vary with the age and weight and volume vary with 30 to 240 ml and should be sufficient to meet the calorie need of most patients. But in patients with uh, duodenal or jejunal access, uh, bolus delivery may result in cramping, nausea, vomiting, uh, aspiration and diarrhea. It also important to remember bolus administration should be avoided in patients with delayed gastric emptying and in a patient who are at high risk of aspiration. Intermittent feeding. Uh, it's also like a bolus feeding. Intermittent feed, feeding is, is administrated over a long time period, generally around 20 to 60 minutes. Usually bolus feeding 5 to 10 minutes. Administrated by enteral pump or via gravity drip using roller clamp. Patients who need long-term enteral nutrition and parental nutrition, especially children, may benefit when this approach is used because it may minimize uh, the development of uh, cholesterol liver disease. Uh, okay, now I'm going to talk about blenderized feeding as it is commonly used in Sri Lanka and there are no more new research available suggesting blenderized meal in Western world as well. But the most uh, important thing uh, here to remember is blenderized meal is not a super kindly blended into meal, but a carefully planned therapeutic meal by a specialized person. Uh, Blenderized meal, sometimes referred uh, to as a puree diet to gastrectomy tube, homemade tube, feeding, real food, whole food, uh, like that. Most of the time, home uh, prepared food are liquefied in blended and given to a NG tube. Blenderized tube can be replaced some of the feeding or all of the feeding. It can also be made using commercial product as a part of recipe. 
some recipes use baby food for increased consistency and eliminating the need for a high quality blend uh, blenderized meal are more popular among patients due to several factors i would say eating or food habit is a culture so no matter the disease condition one may have he or she would like to be a part of that culture hence blenderized meal has become a popular because it is natural and something which can be shared with the family given them a feeling that they are normal in addition it is better tolerated and does not give rise too much food allergies blend rice can uh, blend rice uh, meal can be safely and effectively prescribed for patient with various need when compared to formula feed before giving a blend rice meal for a patient you have to assess the suitability for giving blend rice meal so who is suitable a medically stable patient so just yes, uh, on the enteral regime at home any patient with syringe uh, any patient with syringe bolus uh, feeding or feeding with hang time less than 2 hours patient with an enteral tube at least 10 uh, tube size usually 14 is the better a patient with peg or gastric feeding a patient with volume tolerance a patient who has motivated parent and or caregivers having facilities such as refrigerator electricity blenders access to clean uh, water and food for the pediatric patient who are more than 8 months of age suitable for blenderized meal patient being able to meet uh, fluid need with flushes also we have to uh, think about before uh, uh, prescribed blenderized meal who is not suitable for blenderized meal Uh, children who are aged less than six months, uh, who has small gastrostomy tube less than ten French size, patient with jejunostomy tube, any distal feeding uh, uh, not suitable for blenderized meal. Patient who required continuous feeding, patient who are immunocompromised, patient with malabsorption issue uh, where uh, issues and where. resources motivation and skill is not available those kind of patient not suitable for blenderized meal as i have discussed earlier uh, blenderized meal uh, serves patient psychological need it also reduces reflux and constipation it has an added advantage by having phytochemical and fibers when compared to the commercially available formulas it improve reaching and gagging promoting oral intake okay right uh, after discussing the type of formula type of feeding blenderized meal uh, ultimately we have to decide which feed which route which Uh, type of feed into be chosen for which patient for that we need to consider factors related to both patient and formula patient requirement uh, medical and surgical condition organ function access fluid status are important factors to think about further uh, the composition of the formula uh, calorie density uh, calorie density Uh, types, uh, fiber content, viscosity, method of feeding, and the cost are also important to consider when deciding the feeding regime. Uh, after deciding everything on feeding and initiation feeding, monitoring becomes really important. We need to monitor patient vital signs, clinical condition, uh, GI tolerance. tube placement and laboratory investigation feeding efficacy uh, continuity and outcome heavily depend on the decision taken with monitoring uh, then we have to look for complication as well
Okay. Uh, the uh, complication of enteral feeding restrict the use of enteral feeding. Among them, uh, diarrhea is one of the commonest complication. Uh, diarrhea uh, may be due to feeding related, drug related, or infection related. Feeding related complications are due to the rapid delivery or advancement of formula, intolerance to the formula composition, large volume to the small bowel, or formula contamination. Drug related complication are due to broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, sometimes orbital use as the sweetening agent in many liquid formulation to enhance palatability. Drug in liquid for uh, drug in liquid from causing hypoosmolarity. Uh, most important thing, Clostridium difficile is the most frequent pathogen when uh, caused diarrhea in these type of patients. So we have to uh, instigate it uh, for the Clostridium difficile uh, infection. We have to rule out. Then mechanical complication. Uh, mechanical complication of nasoenteral tube feeding. Uh, here I have shown this algorithm to highlight the importance of having such algorithm in view, uh, in view of managing feeding complication. Without assessing the problems uh, here and there, we can, uh, we can follow this mechanism to identify, assess, and manage uh, mechanical complication of nasoenteral PD. I want to highlight the fact that the position of NJ tube should be checked with PH pairing. Without using the proper mechanism, if a patient develops aspiration pneumonia, uh, and the uh, uh, patient develop uh, aspiration pneumonia and to receive ICU care, the expenses which the hospital has to bear is very much higher than the cost of pH testing of all the patients in the hospital for a period of one year. Uh, so I think we have to move uh, to pH testing uh, rather than other method. Uh, Mechanical complication of gastrostomy tube and jejunostomy tube. Here I am uh, not going to talk about all these complications as I am talking to an audience who are handling all these problems frequently. But today I want to highlight one thing that is feeding tube occlusion. Feeding tube occlusion usually results from the improper administration of medication and no flushing technique. Uh, kinking of the tube also may cause occlusion. Hence, to minimize occlusion, uh, 30 ml of water should be administered before and after administration of medication and feed. If the feeding is continuous, flushing should be done every eight hours. If occlusion occurs, attempt to irrigate the tube with warm water. A pancreatic enzyme can be used if warm water fail. If this attempt fails, some uh, practice uh, uh, flushing the tube with coal and uh, Canberra juice, but it is not recommended. If we are uh, to administer drug to a patient who is on enteral feeding, uh, there are several things to remember. One thing is uh, if the patient is on bolus or intermittent feeding, give the drugs when the patient is in empty stomach to minimize the drug nutrient reaction. If the patient is on continuous feeding, we have to time drag administration by temporarily discontinuing the feed. Uh, so that we have uh, 30 to 40 minute uh, feeding free interval before and after drug administration. Drug administration. Uh, we have to be extra cautious uh, with drugs such as phenytoin, warfarin, and omeprazole. Uh, 
Denitone uh, dose may be adjusted or increased than the usual dose to get therapeutic outcome. Omeprazole should be dissolved in an acidic liquid. Uh, warfarin, also, warfarin dose also should be adjusted according to INR. Okay, uh, with the above slide, uh, the major portion of my lecture is over. Uh, as, I uh, as I have focused more on enteral feeding, now I wish to uh, outline parental nutrition principles. The major point I want to convey is parental nutrition should be considered only when it is not possible to meet an individual nutrition requirement by enteral route. Let's look at the indication of parental nutrition. When the gut is not function or, uh, functional or accessible, uh, bowel obstruction or suspected gut ischemia, uh, gastrointestinal fistula, that high, high output fistula, short bowel syndrome, uh, persistent severe diarrhea or significant malabsorption, uh, persistent sign of uh, significant gut dysmotility, uh, large gastric aspirates, aspirates or, or no bowel output. Those are the uh, uh, indication for parental nutrition. Okay, as I have mentioned earlier, whether to start on PN, otherwise parental nutrition or not, should be carefully decided. Especially in a country with limited resource, we need to analyze the cost benefits ratio also. On the other hand, we have to minimize the infection risk as well. Therefore, best thing is to have these sort of algorithm in every unit to uh, every unit to facilitate decision making on initiation PA. So, uh, what are the type of PEN solution available? Uh, there are several types. One is the standard bag, three in one solution, which is a single bag with three separate chamber. Uh, example, uh, uh, cabbyware. They contain carbohydrate, protein, and fat separately. This is easy to handle and has a less infection rate. In some of these bags, fat composition is increased to maintain the osmolarity below 900. So it can be given to a peripheral light. Uh, standard uh, two-in-one bag. Uh, currently, we don't have this type of bag uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, standard two-in-one uh, bag have no fat, but carbohydrate and protein. So uh, for a patient who is in liver failure and hepatic steatosis, this can be used safely to minimize potential liver damage by fat. Okay, uh, in modular product, uh, amino acid, glucose, and lipid come in separate bottle. In glucose, uh, glucose can be used to provide up to 70% of energy requirement. If the concentration is more than 10, we have to use central line. Uh, to prevent hyper, uh, hyperglycemia, fatty liver, and respiratory problem, glucose uh, drip should be given less than 5 milligram per minute per kg per body weight. Ideally, it should be around 3 milligram per kg per uh, 3 milligram per minute kg per body weight. In amino acid solution, uh, protein, uh, 
protein have high osmolarity therefore the only option is the central line except from uh, for some pediatric preparation so if, if we are using amino acid we we have to use central line when it comes to lipid uh, lipid emulsion is the soluble form of the fat which allows fat to safely infuse into blood because it has less osmolarity it can be given through a peripheral line as well earlier fat uh, earlier fat product were mainly made from soya but newer product have mixture of soya mct olive and fish oil which is less inflammatory uh hence it can be tolerated by liver more efficiently in addition uh if we use a 20% fat than 10% it is liver friendly and less uh liver complication but fat infusion increase risk of infection hence it is recommended to use 12 hour infusion but not for 24 hour infusion okay then uh, feed in site feed in site should be decided according to the type of pn solution most importantly we need to consider the facilities we have before deciding all these all central line have unique advantage and disadvantage uh, uh, and disadvantages we'll discuss uh, central line one by one uh non tunnel central catheter uh, out of all central line most commonly used catheter in sri lanka is non tunnel central catheter uh, as this has multiple lumen there has to be a dedicated line for parental nutrition it is not indicated to give long term pn nutrition through this because generally the non tunnel uh, central line generally replaces after about 7 to 10 days uh it's enter blood stream via jugular subclavian or femoral vein a pick line uh, peripherally inserted central catheter line uh pick line or peripheral insert central catheter uh, this is commonly used for uh, chemotherapy but this also can be used for pn usually enters blood stream via basilic or capillary vein uh, can last 12 months unless vein problem occur necessitating replacement but rarely used longer than 2 months at uh, many hospital uh, tunnel catheter uh, this is also called hickman or bovic line uh, for long term parental nutrition this is the ideal catheter as it can be used even for years uh, usually enters blood stream via subclavian vein but is uh, but is tunneled subcutaneously before entering this vein uh, most importantly uh, if we are given to pn through central line having a line care protocol is mandatory if we start pn without a line care protocol patient may die due to a line related sepsis but not for uh, not from pan nutrition so i really want to highlight this point to having protocols for a short term period we can give we can give parental nutrition via uh, peripheral line 
we can give solution having osmolality less than 900 from this line and it can be given only 10 to 14 days. More than 14 days, we can't continue peripheral parental nutrition. Ideally, one line can be used for feeding only three days and we should change the cannula site accordingly. Choice of nutrition regime in parental nutrition. Uh, PN also has two regime as in, uh, in enteral nutrition. Continuous parental nutrition is parental nutrition infused for 24 hours continuously. This is the most common type of, uh, type of regime in the hospital setting. Infusion rate usually range between 40 to 150 ml per hour. Advantage of this regimes, uh, regime, uh, regimen are it allows the lowest possible hourly infusion rate to meet nutrition requirement. It, provide, uh, it provides a, a better control of blood glucose level due to continuous carbohydrate input. It may result in better utilization of, uh, utilization of nutrition. Uh, disadvantage are uh, the physical uh, attachment to the pump, which may affect quality of life, high risk of biliary stasis uh, if the patient are not on oral or enteral intake. Uh, promote continuous high insulin level, which may increase risk of fatty liver. Those are the disadvantage of uh, continuous parental nutrition. Uh, Uh, when it's come to cyclic or intermittent parental nutrition infusion, uh, it allows greater patient mobility, which may improve uh, uh, quality of life. Uh, cyclic uh, or intermittent nutrition is a parental nutrition, which run over short period and then stop uh, and then stop. Uh, it mimics uh, physiological feeding, fasting pattern, which may help to prevent accumulation of fat in the liver and sludge in the biliary system. Uh, those are the advantage of this uh, cyclical feeding, uh, parental nutrition. Disadvantages uh, compared with continuous nutrition, a higher infusion rate is required to provide the same volume of feed. This may be less well tolerated with the uh, high risk of uh, problems such as uh, fluid overloads uh, and frequent uh, urination during uh, infusion, inconvenient especially at night, uh, electrolytes fluctuation and unstable blood glucose level. Uh, So far, we have discussed about the type of PN formulation, PN administration method, and site. To achieve a successful parental nutrition outcome, every hospital should have a PN support team. The team should be uh, comprised of GI specialist, nutrition specialist, critical care specialist, and a well-trained nursing team, especially well-trained nursing team, especially for line care. Therefore, I hope that we can develop a team like this in Sri Lanka in the near future. Okay, I have come to the end of my talk. I would like to summarize some important point as take home message. Uh, in summary, decision on enteral and parental nutrition should be taken carefully after analyzing all the factors related to patient indication and resources. The decision has to be rational and taken 
within the correct time frame. Enteral nutrition formula are not milk, but the therapeutic food. Uh, blenderized milk for patient is not blended old fashioned soup or kanji, but carefully designed milk. There has to be a clear indication to start parental nutrition. Monitoring is vital in parental nutrition. Line care should be done by especially trained nursing team. Nutrition support team is the key to a, a successful enteral and parental nutrition outcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to wind up my uh, lecture uh, now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Timothy, uh, for that uh, excellent lecture, for enlightening us on that uh, topic that's fairly neglected in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, there have been some questions that have sent in uh, on both enteral and parental nutrition. I'll start with the enteral ones. Uh, uh, there's a question on uh, what are the commercially available products with high protein content which can be used for cirrhotic patients? All right. Uh... We can, uh, in, in Sri Lankan market, uh, several companies, they, uh, uh, they have a uh, high protein product. Uh, Astron, they have uh, uh, protein, uh, uh, they have a, uh, uh, Nestle, they have whey protein and uh, uh, Nestle, they have whey protein. Aston, they have peptogen. And uh, uh, there is uh, there's another company called uh, Pentasure. They have uh, 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 some high protein uh, products called uh, Pentasure uh, high protein. Like. Pentasure hepatic. They have a one yeah. for pentasho hepatic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. pentasho hepatic yeah. also have yeah. high protein. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the second question is, when do you consider immune nutrition? Right. It's a uh, uh, debatable because uh, earlier most of the uh, upper GI surgery and brain surgery they recommended uh, immune nutrition uh, before surgery and uh, after surgery as well purpose after surgery as well but uh, in newer researchers uh, there are some uh, there are now newer research say there are no enough evidence to use immune nutrient but uh, it's debatable but still we can uh, give immune nutrient for upper GI surgery mainly uh, and uh, uh, brain surgery So what exactly is immune nutrition? Uh, it uh, the immune nutrient. It has a uh, uh, immune uh, compound, uh, glutamine, uh, uh, then uh, uh, omega three, uh, then another uh, uh, two uh, uh, compound uh, uh, nucleotides and uh, I. <laughs> I can't remember exactly other things, uh, but uh, that uh, it will uh, improve the uh, it will uh, help to uh, minimize the inflammation and improve the gut pain, uh, gut uh, gut uh, uh, stability. So therefore, uh, less uh, bacteria infiltrating into the gut uh, mucosa. That is the basis. And regarding uh, nutrition in uh, malignant patients, uh, yeah. would you advise high protein supplements? And if so, yeah. what, what, what is the percentage yes. of protein the, that you would recommend? Yes. The, in the malignant uh, patient, first thing we have to uh, decide uh, the patient outcome. In palliative care, uh, uh, newer guideline not recommended for high protein uh, supplement, but uh, 
because of the malignancy in nature, they use a lot of uh, energy and protein, uh, and uh, those patients have higher uh, uh, body, uh, higher uh, uh, BMR. So uh, we can go up to uh, 1.5 to 2 gram per kg, uh, even we can go up to 2.5 gram per kg uh, if there's no renal involvement. Because if there's any renal uh, problem, we can't go beyond 1.5. And what's your idea on uh, appetite uh, stimulants, especially for these malignancy patients? Yeah, uh, there are a lot of uh, research going on uh, regarding uh, this uh, field, especially they use uh, steroids and uh, other appetite stimulants. Then, but uh, still, uh, there's no uh, enough conclusive evidence for that. Uh, even European guidelines, they, uh, uh, they are not recommended uh, appetite stimulant for their guidelines. And you said about the, the pH testing for uh, nasogastric tubes. Yeah. Uh, is the pH uh, strips uh, available in Sri Lanka? I think it's not yeah, just yeah. a normal. It's no. Yeah, a I don't know. Uh, type yeah. of because of the COVID, I don't know, but it is available. Only thing uh, we have to uh, order via uh, MSD. I think it's very cost effective thing uh, because uh, we don't have any audit about the aspiration pneumonia. But uh, we know there are some cases every month in a hospital uh, with aspiration pneumonia. So uh, actually we, we should have some kind of uh, protocol uh, for all the enteral tube uh, uh, manage, manage or enteral nutrition uh, complication. Therefore, I, I hope uh, as your society should uh, should uh, produce some uh, uh, guideline for especially position of the tube and uh, how what we uh, what we have to do if there's any problem in uh, uh, any misplacement how can we uh, uh, overcome and how can uh, we uh, assure uh, the uh, tube position there should be uh, some protocol i think uh, your society will give a uh, I hope you will give a good uh, guideline for that, uh, I think. Yeah, I think it's very important. I personally have seen two patients who have uh, died of aspiration following yeah, 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 yeah. space. And, yeah. yeah. and the cost ICU care is very yeah. expensive. pH only we have to expend 20 to 25 rupees. And about uh, feeding with uh, nasojejunal tubes, you said that blenderized uh, formulas are not... Uh, would put to feed in, uh, via nasal jejunal tube. Uh, in that instance, uh, what should we use? That's why right. usually we, but in practical uh, scenario, we use blenderized meal for distal feeding also. But because of the uh, osmolarity, we can't match the osmolarity uh, in blenderized meal. So there may be some uh, issue with uh, gastric mortality and uh, diarrhea will occur. Uh, if there's no such a complication, we can use blenderized meal, but better to use enteral formula in distal feeding, especially malnutrition patients. Are they available? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. enteral formula means the isocal, sustacal, those, all the right. products are enteral formula. We have enough products oh. and uh, we have enough yeah. companies also. And uh, regarding parenteral one, nutrition, yeah. uh, how would you suspect infection of a central line? And how would you, uh, how should this be ideally managed? Uh, yeah. Like empiric if, antibiotics are yeah, they recommended? Yeah, if we, yeah. If we uh, suspected uh, line, sepsis, uh, line sepsis, uh, best thing we should do a uh, blood culture and uh, line culture simultaneously. And uh, if the blood culture is uh, positive, line culture is negative, then we can 
use uh, line lock. That means we can give uh, antibiotic to the line and uh, keep uh, 12 hours and then we can flush. Uh, but line culture also positive. Uh, if it is line culture positive with uh, MRSA of uh, fungal infection, we should uh, remove the line uh, in situ. Otherwise, we can use uh, antibiotic for line lock and then uh, after 12 days, then we can use the same line for the PNPD. Uh, and I think this is a bit off topic, but uh, how, how would you uh, assess the nutrition pre in the pre-operative setting? I think it's a, a vast topic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the nutritional assessment, I think uh, <laughs> it's not a uh, single thing. So we, uh, we use uh, some uh, tool, uh, uh, anthropometrically, biochemically, uh, and uh, even uh, BIA, like uh, it should be, uh, uh, it should be done in uh, that uh, mul uh, mul uh, using multiple approach. So for that, we have to take uh, anthropometric measurements, uh, biochemical measurements, hematological measurements, and if we have some facilities, we can use radiological measurement also for the complete nutritional assessment. Okay, uh, so I think those are the only questions that have been uh, sent in. Uh, so uh, like, thank you, Dr. Dimitri. Thank you very much for uh, that excellent lecture and for answering all those questions. And uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology, I would like to uh, pay our gratitude for, for to you for taking up this uh, uh, topic and enlightening us, us on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.